Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Modern Business Operations. I'm your host, Seth Colliner, and with me today is Sarah Barnes-Humphrey, who is the founder and host of Let's Talk Supply Chain, a podcast. Uh, Sarah, thank you for being here. Um, and as we uh, begin here, why don't you just share a bit about your background and your, your current role? Yeah. Hi, Seth. Thank you so much for having me on the show. So I've been in logistics and supply chain for over 25 years. <laughs> and I spent majority of my career working for a freight forwarder, which if anybody doesn't know what that is, it's kind of like a cargo or a travel agent for cargo. Um, and then I ended up sort of going into podcasting to try to help that brand and then ended up really diving into podcasting. And uh, the rest is kind of history. I don't know how much you want me to go into it because you might have some questions for me. But um, we started Let's Talk Supply Chain back in 2018. Prior to that, the podcast actually started in 2016. Very good. Well, yeah. So I, I do want to get a, a little more into that and just just your whole journey, um, because as uh, your entrepreneurial journey, because as is often the case, it was not a straight line for you to get where you are now um, in in the supply chain. And you know, it's it's one of the, one of those fields where you know no one goes off to be a freshman in college saying like I'm going to be in the supply chain. So I, I'm just curious about that journey um, because I think it's just uh, it's an interesting story. Yeah. So I have two entrepreneurial parents. And it was a family business. The freight forwarding company was a family business. And I actually didn't go to college or university. I went to the school of life, I think, or the school of business within business. So after high school, I went straight into the family business, started off as reception. But I also did courses by correspondence. And I always had side hustles. But it also gave me the opportunity to um, really understand the inner workings of a freight forwarding company and really supply chain and logistics. So I worked in every single department. <laughs> I was in operations for eight years, sales for eight years, and then I was director of sales and marketing. And that's where I was like, well, we need something different to be able to tell our brand story. And I was listening to a lot of podcasts at the time. And I decided if Lewis Howes can have a podcast, why can't Sarah Barnes Humphrey? And if you don't know who Lewis Howes is, he's the school of greatness, 2 million downloads, I think a month or something like that. Um, and that's the journey. I asked a guy from my customs department to be on the show and tongue in cheek, we called it two babes talk supply chain because like marketing and supply chain back then in 2016, yeah, you know, wasn't very good. We wanted to push the envelope. Um, in the fall of 2017, my dad closed his doors and I was out on my butt, no team, no co-host, no nothing. I had to learn everything, graphic design, social media, website design, but I had companies paying to come on the show. And, uh, so I had to keep it going and I did keep it going. And in January, 2018, I started the woman in supply chain series as a part of the podcast. And by April, no women would come on a show called Two Babes Talk Supply Chain. So I rebranded it in a week to Let's Talk Supply Chain. And the rest is history. We've really grown the brand so much in the last five or six years. And we offer so many different things. There's a big community. So, yeah. Uh, fantastic. Uh, well, it's... it's um... I'm I'm guessing your approximate age here, but it sounds like you have, you managed to avoid what many of many of us uh, who were let's say elder millennials um, hit, where it was we were told just to go to college and figure it out, and it'll, it'll work itself out. And, and turns out that was not the case at all. <laughs> well, the, so I think we're in the same age range. I mean, I am 43. I don't have any problems talking about that. Um, and so I grew up, you know, in the 80s and the 90s. <laughs> And yeah, there was a lot of talk about college university, but my parents were more entrepreneurial. And so it wasn't ever really, it was like, are you going to go? And if you're going to go, what are you going to do? And I looked at private investigation because my grandfather was in the Scotland Yard. He was a cop. He was a policeman okay, in the Scotland cool. Yard. And I wanted to be like him. I wanted to do that. The problem is I'm not very good with blood. Yeah, small. So I wouldn't small have been able, detail. and I, and there was so many different things you have to do to get to detective that I didn't want to do. So I looked at private investigation. I was like, mm, I don't know if I really want to do this. I'm just going to go work. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I I did the thing that a lot of uh, elder millennials did, which was uh, I just went I just went to get a degree when whatever I wanted, which was music, and okay. uh, 
it was quite enjoyable to get. Um, and then I just started from scratch after grad school um, because it turns out nobody needs you to write operas for them. So nobody? it's really no, nobody. No, nobody. it's weird, right? Uh, so, but you know, it's funny because like you, you, your story is kind of like I just sort of figured it out. Um, mm -hmm. But that's what the rest of us have done this century too, right? We just sort of mm -hmm. figured out like I found my way into journalism and did that for a long time in, in tech uh, and, and have pivoted into you know, the content marketing side of things. And, and I, I can't stay away from media. So I'm, you know, podcasting for us and, and writing constantly right. and, and all that. So um, it's, it's, yeah, there are like no direct paths to anything anymore. Um, I'm not sure that's a, a bad thing, but it, it certainly takes uh, time and effort. So mm -hmm. anyway, at this point now, um, especially with your podcast, you, you have such a unique view of the supply chain. Um, because you talk to so many different people. Uh, so I, I just want to get your like your 30,000 foot view of things, especially as it pertains to the innovation and change, uh, which, which you've had a you know front row seat to for the last uh, what's been six years or, or so, six or seven years. So, um, so yeah, give us that 30,000 foot view. And, and, you know, how is technology changing the supply chain right now? How much time do you have? <laughs> as much time <laughs> as you have. No, and I just, I ask that because there's so many different things that are going on. And we get uh, data and input from the community in a variety of different ways, from the podcast, live shows, polls. We do questions of the week to really find out, you know, what people are going through. And it's funny, one of the polls that we asked a couple of weeks ago was about what is the emoji that sums up your 2023? Yeah. And somebody commented a fire extinguisher, right? Yeah. Which really kind of sums up 2023 and how we're even going into 2024 because there's all sorts of disruptions. So from a supply chain professional standpoint, even from a leadership standpoint in supply chain, I think things are just a little bit overwhelming, right? There's so many things you have to think about, make decisions on, and there's only so much time. There's only so much budget right? When it comes to implementing new technologies and where do we start? and What do we prioritize? And it's interesting because some of the leaders are really like, you know, do we have enough budget, energy, and time to test new technologies? But at the same time, you almost need to have the freedom to be able to test them because you don't know what you don't know. And then what happens is you go back to the same old <laughs> and that doesn't work in supply chain anymore. And so I think there's a lot of overwhelm. I think there's a lot of information. I think there's a lot of new technology that's out there. I think the technology is great, but I think we're still almost at the point of, you know, making sure our data is okay, <laughs> right? As an input into that technology to make sure that the technology can actually serve you to be the solution that you want it to be. And one of the things that we did on our podcast is we feature companies on the show, who you are, what you do, real life examples of how you help a customer, you know, because we want to help sort of uh, break through that noise. So before they even get into a sales funnel and before, because at that point, they don't even really know whether it's going to help them or not. Um, we provide them with that resource so that they can actually see who's out on the market and whether they're the right fit for them, because we even ask them, like, who's your ideal client? Right. So that that's really a baseline. Yeah. Well, and, uh, you know, in terms of, of where things are, I mean, how are how are lead leaders handling these changes and those challenges? I mean, because that's, you know, to your point, that's a tough one, right, of, of having the discipline uh, to budget time and energy to just vet what's available. Right. Um, you know, just yeah. from from your perspective, your experience, how are leaders even dealing with that? Like what's what's the emotional temperature, so to speak? I, I would go back to that word overwhelm. I think there's a lot of things that need to change. There's a lot of things that need to be improved through technology. And again, only so much time and energy and budget. Right. Um, I think supply chain teams, I think leaders are are also realizing how much internal collaboration is really needed. Um, supply chain is getting a seat at the table from a C-suite level, uh, you know, CEOs and leaderships at that le level are understanding how important supply chains are to the business overall, and then to each part of the organization and how it actually affects the supply chain, which then affects the business overall. And I think that 
I think that teams are still a little bit slim, right? There's been some layoffs. Um, and I think that supply chain leaders are realizing that they also need, you know, people on their team that understand the technology side, right? Leaders don't know everything about everything. They're not, and I don't think they should be expected to. They should be able to be able to build that right team to support them in making the right decisions, um, being able to navigate some of the disruptions that are happening because there's a lot. And again, there's a lot of things to consider. And so how are you working with your team to really understand what is a priority, what's not a priority, where are we going to put our time, money, and effort for the next six months? And that's the other thing. I don't think they're looking long term. I think we're running mm. in sprints. I think we're running in three to six month sprints just because of the disruption and how fast things are changing right now, which is also a departure from how we really look at supply chains and business of the past. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it, you know, some of like the seismic changes in supply chain, like obviously the pandemic uh, was was a massive one. Um, but yeah, sprints, sprint sounds, I, it almost sounds like a, like a desperation or is, or is that just the pace at which we need to be moving right now? I think it's just a pace, right? Because with everything changing as fast as it does, and the technology and the innovation happening as fast as it as it is as well, right? I mean, look at AI. You know, everybody's talking about generative AI. Now that affects us from a multitude of different places. One is cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. We can't even keep the pace with cybersecurity to keep us safe, right? And cybersecurity yeah. is one of the top risks in supply chain right now. And that's only one case of AI. And then AI right. touches all multitudes of different places. People only have enough time, money, and effort and er energy to deal with one or two things at a time. But it can't take you a year to go to do it and make a decision. That's what I mean about the sprints. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I suppose you you have to have the, I don't know, courage maybe to to end a sprint with nothing specific to show for it. Like, okay, you got your team dove into these options. What do you have? It's like, what we need is not available yet. Well, it's and available, it's also will not serve courage. our needs. And, but it's yeah. also the courage to, um, and it's, it's part courage, but it's also the leadership above you to give you the ability to try things and fail. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah. That's what I was getting at. Yes. You've articulated yeah. that uh, much better. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, and, you know, and how, you know, how are we, how are companies seeing all of this playing out at the organizational level? Right. So the part of the the subtext of that question is, is I, I keep having the same conversation again and again, where all of these different verticals suddenly have a seat at the table or are demanding a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. And everyone says the same thing. Um, I want my area to be aligned with the business goals. Like no one wants right. to live in a work in a silo. It doesn't make sense. You know, nothing is, perf no area, no department is perfunctory anymore. It all has to be going towards, yep. you know, the larger goals, the larger mission, uh, you know, of the, of the business, you know, and when it comes to, to all of this change in supply chain, like, you know, is your sense that we're seeing, you know, buy-in at the organizational level, or is that still a big challenge? I think it comes down to language and communication a little bit. Right. Because in supply chain, we have a lot of jargon. Right. And we tend to um, talk and speak in that jargon. Right. Procurement has jargon. Right. And so we have to be a little bit careful of when we are collaborating internally, a to understand what affects them on a daily basis and vice versa. And then also understand that we have to present it and talk about it in a way that people understand. Because at that level, people aren't going to say, ah, hold up, I don't really get what you're talking about. Yeah, that's a right? lot of acronyms you're throwing out. I don't know what any of them mean. Yeah, yeah, you know, and if we don't stop and do that through communication, then you're losing people. <laughs> and we can't actually come together internally. Yeah. Well, it's, and it's funny as you're saying that I'm thinking it's, it's a lot of, you know, what historically has been called soft skills, right? It's communication and education, um, being able to explain up in a way that's, you know, concise, direct, um, answers the questions they have before they have the questions, right? Because you're in a room full of people 
who are decision makers and and they've got about five minutes of attention span. Right. And if, if you're not to the point and convincing them, they're done. But it's it's funny to me because in the midst of these, this massive technological change, you know, this, this, this current high tech era, especially with AI, especially with generative AI, you have to be really good at human stuff in order for that to, to work in your company. <laughs> Well, it's interesting that you say that. So I've got I've got two comments on that. One is traditionally we work on gut. Now we have the technology that we're able to provide information and data in a way that people can understand it and understand what the business benefit is. The second thing is around cybersecurity. And I know I'm bringing this up again, but it is one of the top risks in supply chain because what's happening is that those folks understand that if they target a logistics or supply chain company, they can actually take down, like they can create massive chaos, mm. right? But if you do get hit by a cyber attack, the most important thing that you have is A, a plan, right? You Each person in each level of the organization needs to know what they need to be doing at that moment, who they need to be talking to, et cetera, et cetera. The second thing is tribal knowledge, because if everything breaks down and you end up going manual and your team only knows digital, you need the person that has the tribal knowledge that understands how to do things manual to keep the business going. Yeah. Well, and and, and I, I feel like that role everywhere sort of falls on the shoulders of people of a certain age of a certain work generation, like people who entered the workforce or were in college or whatever before you know, let's say the the uh, personal computing and internet wave really landed. You know, so like for me, like I, I bought my first laptop when I was like a sophomore in college, right? And <laughs> okay. I was still using dial-up. Same. <laughs> you know, um, yep. we didn't grow uh, up with a cell phone in our hand, right? And so, so iPad. we bring some of that technology. I, was, I just, I just, uh, my, my last interview with someone who started automating things back in two thousand eight. And a lot of what they did was they took the tools and started breaking them, you know, to see right. what they could do to modify and customize. And that, that was the approach. So, you know, now fast forward 16 years. Yes, it's been 16 years since 2008. Uh, wow. I know. I had to do the math on that call. And I was like, that can't be right. I mean, it's going to be a second on my calculator here. Um, you know, there's so many, so many tools that obviate all of those struggles that can do all kinds of new things, all kinds of new automations and really powerful generative AI things. But it, yeah, it's really important to have people who know a little more than just how to hit the button mm -hmm. um, and sort of, you know, for a lack of a better term, know the struggle. <laughs> like, yeah. remember what it was like. It's like, I remember what it was like when I used to have to, you know, break Excel to to make something work. Uh, but yeah, but for that reason, right? Because things will break down and you need someone to be able to step back and be like, okay, I understand the structure of this. I understand the logic of this thing. We're going to make this work, you know, in the meantime, um, but but also be up to speed on, on everything that's cutting edge and be able to communicate up to, you know, let's be honest, usually uh, older folks, you know, they're 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 in their late 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, and they're the ones at the top of the company making a lot of these decisions. Mm -hmm. And uh, and if you can't explain it to them concisely and neatly, then then it's a no-go, right? Well, I think there's also an element of reverse mentoring that needs to happen as well. Cause I think we can learn from each other both ways. So what a, what a kind and gentle way of saying managing up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, I think I think that there's an importance in mentorship top down, but then we don't talk enough about the mentorship from down up that needs to happen as well, because we only know what we know and we don't know what we don't know. And we can only do that by learning from different people with different backgrounds, perspective, age, et cetera. I mean, I do a lot of work in diversity and inclusion, so could be. Yeah, wrong. right, right. Well, no, ab absolutely. I mean, and and um, you know, I, I think anyone who's been in an organization of any kind that has you know made the effort to become more diverse mm -hmm. um, and inclusive has found has found how how shockingly powerful that is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, absent the, the the moral need for for all that, just the the abilities you gain, the perspectives. You're like, yeah, this this room would not have thought of that without this person and that person, and and uh, you know, being challenged with with fresh ideas. Um, and so often it's like that actually will, you know, be advantageous to our business, to our bottom line. Mm -hmm. uh, never would have guessed without bringing different voices into the room, right? Yeah. What is the best advice you have received in your career? <laughs> Always moisturize. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I've had a lot of really great advice over the years. I don't, 
I don't know if there's one that kind of stands out to me. Um, I've always been very self-driven, self-motivated. I think the one advice that sticks with me that I kind of share with everybody else is to consistently be you because it's too tiring to try to be somebody that you're not. And I think the other thing is like, think outside of the box. A lot of people don't know this, but I um, have struggled with public speaking. Um, It causes me all sorts of anxiety. And instead of going to Toastmasters, I went and got a talent agent and I went on auditions and I got laughed out of audition rooms, but it was okay because I didn't want to be an actress. I really just needed practice of, you know, saying things in front of the camera, saying things in front of people and doing things outside of my comfort zone. Yeah, oh, that's great. Good, good, good life advice as well. Um, and then in finally, in closing, um, is there anything you want to promote uh, or share about yourself or your company? And if people want to contact you, what's what's the best way to do that? So many things. Um, so contact me on LinkedIn, Sarah Barnes dash Humphrey. Make sure to connect with me or follow, follow Let's Talk Supply Chain on LinkedIn and Instagram as well. I'm also over on Instagram. I live in my stories. Um, we, if you go to let's talk supply chain.com, we've got lots of blogs, podcasts. We've got a second podcast called Blended, which is about diversity and inclusion in the workplace. We also have a nonprofit called the Blended Pledge, and we give away grants to cover travel expenses so that diverse voices can say yes to speaking engagements. So get involved with that. And last but not least, we have some community groups, and it's called the Secret Society of Supply Chain. And there's groups for everybody, virtual monthly meetups for women in supply chain, which we also have a women in supply chain series, marketing professionals in supply chain. um, And then we also do exclusive content with best practices from some experts. Excellent. Well, Sarah Barnes Humphrey, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Now you have a, you yourself have a busy podcasting schedule. So thank you for your time. Thanks for having me, Seth. It was awesome to be on your show.